Hello, um, good morning and welcome to First Tuesdays. This is a monthly webinar offered by the Washington State Library as part of our strategic goal to help professional skills among young uh, among library staff statewide. First of all, um, I have a little bit of a business to tend to today before I turn you over to our presenter. I am your facilitator. My um, name is Tammy Masonheimer, and I am the training coordinator here at the State Library. Here's my contact information if you have any questions or comments about our program. Today we have Jeremy Stroud for technical support. And Jeremy, can you please put your contact information into the chat box in case someone needs your help? Hey, thank you. And we'll be recording this webinar today, and it will be posted on the Washington State Library training page later this afternoon. First Tuesdays are brought to you by Washington State Library, which is part of the Office of Secretary of State. Our funder is the Muse Institute of Museum and Library Services through the LSTA Act. And as a requirement of our funding, we're gonna ask that you take a short four question survey that will appear when you close the window at the end of our presentation today. So it's important information and we use this to compile our annual report so we can continue funding for training such as this. And we thank you in advance for your participation in that. Today we have a really great presentation. Um, I want to thank Dr. Michelle Martin for taking time today to talk about using children and young adult literature to talk about diversity. Um, at Dr. Martin's request, questions will be can be entered into chat at any time, and then we'll be asking them of her at the end of the presentation. So Dr. Martin is the Beverly Cleary Endowed Professor for Children and Youth Services at the Information School at the University of Washington, and from 2011 to 2016 was the inaugural Augusta Baker Endowed Chair in Childhood Literacy at the University of South Carolina. She published Brown Gold, Milestones of African American Children's Picture Books, 1845 to 2002 through Rutledge um, in 2004, and founded Readorama, which is readorama.org, a nonprofit that uses children's books as the springboard for year round and summer camp programming. So, thank you, Dr. Martin, for joining us and talking to about this really important subject. And, Dr. Martin. Thank you so much. I'm, uh grateful for uh, this opportunity to share with librarians. Um, I teach lots of uh, current and future librarians and I'm always excited about this opportunity to the, speak with those of you who are in libraries already. So I wanted to give you a sense of what I'm going to be covering today and um, my agenda is to ha is to talk a little bit about why have tough conversations about diversity. I did want to mention also that this program was put together um, in conjunction with my doctoral student, Liz Mills, um, who was busy today, but would otherwise um, be helping me to present the program. Um, but much of the content is, is also hers. Um, so we're going to talk about Patricia Montiel overall's cultural competence article um, that provides a conceptual framework for LIS professionals to sort of be thinking about these ideas. Um, I'm going to cover in, in more depth Crown Ode to the Fresh Cut, which is a picture book. And I have two other picture books. So these are more for sort of early end of the, of the age spectrum. And, um, and then we'll talk some about suggestions for exploring new diverse books. Um, it's hard to fit a lot of this into an hour because I've done this as a three or four hour workshop. And so there, so I'll give you an idea of the things that, um, that we oftentimes um, do when I have this as a, as a longer workshop. And so that's the agenda. And then um, the goals for today, oops, the goals for today, um, to learn a bit about the importance of culture, cultivating cultural competence, and I hope that these are ideas that you're already thinking about, um, to learn about the framework that provides some real concrete ways to think about um, different realms in which um, cultural competence matters and in ways that you can sort of, different ways that you can improve that. And then um, start the process of inward gazing with an activity that I'll describe and, and sort of show you some examples of. And then, um, talk about some suggestions for exploring new picture books and discuss how you might prepare yourself to use these picture books as a lens um, toward greater cultural competence. Um, and then some hands-on activities to support these conversations. So I'm going to have a little bit of participation. If you'll type in your chat bar, um, why, why is there a need to have tough conversations about diversity? Um, and maybe even why now? And Tammy, if you can just sort of read out some of the things that, that people um, type up. 
Um, it's also, as you're sort of thinking and typing, I'll also mention that we've um, been reading a couple of articles in my multicultural resources for youth class that really tell us that children start developing an, an awareness of race at about three years old. Um, and that oftentimes parents, um, the, the ways that parents and caregivers interact with people or react to people, oftentimes kids sort of absorb and into it how they feel about them, even if they're saying one thing, kids pick up on you know, what, what the real deal is. And so, um, so we, we really advocate for having these conversations quite early. Obviously, they'll may, they may take a very different form than if you're talking to teenagers. Um, but for kids for whom these picture books are appropriate, these conversations are also appropriate. All right, so what are we getting to? Well, so far, Jenny says good morning. Good morning. But <laughs> I don't know if people are having trouble finding the chat um, function in okay. the Zoom. All right. So it's a button down there that looks like a little. Okay, so we have one here from Shannon and she says because children deserve to have discussions about what is happening in their world. Mm -hmm. And Marion says um, it brings to awareness our implicit biases and our own racist if well intentioned behaviors and attitudes. Yes. And Carrie's good morning. Um, people are losing their lives due to our collective ignorance and failure to act. Our future depends upon educating our youth. Jean, um, our students are growing up in a diverse world that needs to be part of our school life. Mm -hmm. And Carrie, caregivers, influencers on our youth may not know what is outside their bubble and what to bring into the conversations. Excellent. Diane, how to manage possibly racist comments from my grandson, often in public. Wow. Um, Lee is we need to understand one another. And then we need students to be seen and be seen. Mm -hmm. to, we need students to see and to be seen. See and be seen, yes. And, and we need to understand one another. Kids need to know that we are more alike than different. Mm -hmm. And difficult conversations while young can really make a difference can really make larger changes with the same amount of effort than trying to fix it later. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay. I'm sure y'all have a million other ideas. Yes. <laughs> really sorry. This is a webinar. I want to be in the room with you. Um, and so, yes, yes, absolutely to all of that. Um, and some of the things that I that I also sort of thought about and generated to this question, why have tough conversations about diversity, particularly with very young children. Um, according to Data USA, librarians in 2017 constituted 82.1% or 82.1% of librarians um, were female and 85.9% were white, which is, um, it's, uh, we, the 87% was the statistic a few years ago. And so, um, so there are more librarians of color now than, than there were a few years ago. But on the other hand, according to the Pew Research Center statistics for 2016, 52% of blacks and 50% of Americans living in households with annual incomes of $30,000 or less have visited the library in the past year. So there's a, a great likelihood that who is walking in the doors of your library, especially in many communities that are um, that are urban um, or just have a large uh, diverse population, it's very likely that the diversity of who's walking in the door and those in the library uh, working as librarians and those serving in the library, there's, there's a mix, mismatch there. And so um, we often have a major disconnect between race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status because many of those uh, white librarians in the U.S. also tend to come from middle-class families. Um, between those who uh, are coming into libraries and those who are serving in libraries. And I think that having these conversations helps to bridge some of those gaps. Another thing that I uh, thought about is, um, as you, you all said, increases understanding between those who come from different backgrounds. And then programs such as bilingual story times, bookmobiles, reading programs, um, all of these are oftentimes developed. I hope this isn't true of, of all of you who are on the other end of this webinar, but um, often developed solely by the library with no input from the community members from diverse backgrounds who will actually attend the programs. And so we are really advocating a lot for um, community-based planning, for uh, bringing people in who know exactly what their community needs um, as the library starts developing new programming or continuing to do program that it, that has, it has already started. Um, another a thing is scaffolding relationships between librarians and library users. This is a quote, 
uh, to increase library use by minorities and underserved populations will require LIS professionals to not only, uh, not only be capable of building relationships with communities and who recognize environmental factors that contribute or inhib inhibit library use, but also who understand their own culture, values, and biases as a starting point in working with diverse groups. Um, and this is a quote from Montiel Overall, uh, um, uh, an article that we're going to be using. And then it's often really fun to learn about different backgrounds that are not your own. Um, Liz and I have had a really fun time working on this research. She has a Japanese mother and white father. My parents are African American. And so as we've been working on different research that come from those backgrounds, um, it's really been a learning experience for both of us. Okay, here's another question and I'm going to need Tammy to kind of read out what what everybody's finding. What is cultural competence and, and why does it matter? Alright, so y'all put on your thinking cap. And Amanda mentioned earlier, uh, when you're sending messages via chat, if you select the two drop down, you can change it from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everyone sees what you're typing. And if you're not sure what cultural competence is, make some guesses. It's fine. Back yet, Tammy? Nope, not yet. Yeah. Okay. But somewhat from the last comments, um, there was a comment that the present political climate means we need to be do more and always be vigilant. Yes. Yes, and uh, the hate, hate crimes are, are way up um, from a few years ago. And so this is something to really attend to because the earlier you, you know, help kids to understand that difference isn't a threat, um, the easier it'll be as, as an adult. So Jean says that cultural competency is the ability to interact with diverse cultures. Yes. And I don't know if chat is slow or if okay. it's, yeah, it's just. <laughs> How many folks do we have on? So far there's 40 here. Wow, all right. Yeah. So awesome. cultural competence equals appreciating differences and the benefits of those differences. And then also having an understanding of the value of each culture and how to be inclusive of all. Mm -hmm. And openness and humility. Cultural competence is something to always attempt, but we'll probably never completely get it. Mm -hmm. And then Shannon, it's being open to learning about yourself and others. And from Jean, it's important because our students are living in a diverse world. Yeah. Good. 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 Yes. Yes to all of that. All right. So here's what Montiel overall, uh, how she defines, um, and the uh, I have the next slide has the full documentation for this article. Um, but she says cultural competence is the ability to recognize the significance of culture in one's own life. And I want you to take note of the fact that she starts with self and in the lives of others and to come to know and respect diverse cultural backgrounds and characteristics through interaction. That's really important with individuals. You can't get it from TV um, with individuals from diverse linguistic, cultural and social economic groups and to fully integrate the culture of diverse groups into services, work, and institutions in order to enhance the lives of both those being served by the library profession and those engaged in service. And so I highlighted a few things, um, one's own culture, and when she builds this framework for cultural competence, that own part is where she begins. Um, and then interaction being really important of being able to, um, you know, sort of be a contact zone between um, with you and and children, families from from different backgrounds, and to be able to um, welcome everybody into the library, and then um, linguistic, cultural, and social economic. And sometimes social economic is difficult. Um, I've been doing uh, some collaborating with Seattle public librarians and hearing about you know overdoses in the library, about homelessness in the library, and sort of how do you deal with that and be able to make those people just as welcome as everybody else. Um, and then fully integrate the culture of diverse groups into services, work, and institutions 
to enhance not just the folks out there, but our lives as well. Um, and I think that last part of this sentence tells you that the work of, of doing cultural competence and really taking it seriously will change you. Um, all right, and so here are some sort of takeaways from, from this piece that is from the, uh, the rest of the article. Cultural competence is dynamic and ongoing. Somebody mentioned you never, you'll never really get it. Um, and this is about, it, it's, I sort of think about cultural competence not so much as um, a, an adjective and a noun, but as a verb that it's an ongoing thing and there's always more to learn. It's also true that you will be more culturally competent in some realms than in others. And as an example of that, when I first presented this for the school library uh, base camp, um, school library journal base camp, I read Crown and it talks about, um, it, it talks about dark Caesar. And I thought that was just somebody who's brown, but is you know handsome like Caesar. No, that's an actual haircut. And so even I, who had been going to the barbershop for a long time, didn't really know all of the details that, that showed up in this book. And so um, sometimes you really have to study up and do more homework, even if it's about your own culture. And then cultural competence is not in with knowledge. I mean, you can read about it, you can study about it, you can Google about it. It doesn't begin with, it doesn't end with knowledge of diverse cultures, because there's a lot that you can learn um, but until you have that, you know, that contact, um, it begins a lifelong process of learning about cultural differences to effectively reach those who would benefit the most from library services. And I'll say um, educational services as well, because, you know, teachers are really need um, just as much, if not more, in some cases, cultural competence as librarians do. All right, let's see. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is sort of talk about this framework um, and uh, I'm, I'm from, my PhD is in English and so I am last, just in the last eight years or so in library information science. And so um, LIS folks love these sort of visual graphic things. So I'll kind of help you un unpack it. Um, but please put any questions or comments that you have in the chat box. Um, as I go, I'll pause after this before I dive into the books and um, we can talk about that. Okay. So that this Venn diagram, that circle on the left, cognitive, I like to think about this as inward gazing. Where am I? What, what am I thinking? What am I doing? What's my background? Um, I have a student right now who says that he grew up in a very racist household. He acknowledged as a teenager that that wasn't the best um, way to be. And so he's having to do a lot of work to try to figure out what, how his background is going to interact with the work that he has to do in libraries. And so, um, so these are things that, that you have to think about. So what she lists are cultural self-awareness, cultural self-examination, identifying underlying cultural assumptions, cultural knowledge, shared cultural knowledge, insights into cultural differences, and sensitivity to cultural differences. Um, I grew up in a household in South Carolina in the 19, I was born in the 60s, uh, grew up in the 70s. Um, and everything that I look at, everything that I do is through that lens. I am a Southern girl, um, grew up on grits and, and oftentimes on, you know, ideas that wouldn't necessarily do well to interact with, with other people. Um, for instance, my dad regularly used the N word on people that, on black people that he didn't like. Well, that's not something that I would go out and do in public. Um, that's not something I would do in private but it's something that is a part of my background. It's a part of my baggage and something that, that has to be a part of my inward gazing as well. So starting with the self, um, because that is gonna inevitably interact in any of your um, you know, dealings with other people, that, that part has to come first. So one of the activities that I recommend sort of starts to help you think about what this inward gazing piece um, means and looks like. And then the interpersonal, um, she lists cultural appreciation, emotional connections, ethic of caring, authentic caring, desire to know others' culture, personal and cultural interaction, communication, participation with cultural groups through community-based learning and service learning. Um, so this is, the, this is the sort of back and forth. And this is, you know, if you're facilitating a story time, um, not only your interaction with the parents and with the children, um, caregivers, whoever bring the kids in, but also facilitating interactions between them. Um, and so 
yesterday I, I started a program down at the Magnuson Park Y and um, and I was helping my student who's leading the program but I was also interacting with the kids and so you know sort of watching some of the um, their interactions around the books um, that we were talking about um, was was an awesome thing but oftentimes if we're talking about tough conversations sometimes things come up somebody mentioned that you know she wants to learn more so that she knows how to react when her grandson makes racist racist comments out in public you know what other people can hear and so those are all interpersonal things that 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 really matter and then environmental i think probably of the three this one's the hardest to kind of wrap your brain around um, but this one's about setting resources assets language transportation home mobility sense of security family housing and conditions um, and so these environmental conditions, some of them are within your library. Many of them are within your library here. So for instance, um, I think about the environmental is what kind of welcome do people feel when they walk into your library, when they walk into your classroom, when they walk into your space. Um, I took a, a group of students to Australia and New Zealand last summer. And one of the things that I did was had them spend two days in a library, sort of an embedded librarianship day. And I had two students who went to Blacktown Library, which is where many of the Aboriginal people live outside of Sydney. And um, when you walk into that library, they have shelves and shelves and shelves of all the different languages, materials, and all the different languages represented in their community. What a welcome is that, right? That there's there have been there's not only space set aside, but there are financial resources set aside. You know, um, all those things for the folks who come from all over the world to live in Blacktown to be able to enjoy um, all the resources that they have there. Um, so um, what kind of, you know, how easy is it to get to your library? How easy is it to get around your library? Um, you know, how safe is it? And then, you know, the conditions of, of family housing and whatnot that um, enable people to, to access your, the, all of the resources that you have there. Um, and also sometimes I think that like library fines uh, figure into this because if people feel afraid to come into the library because they know they owe the library money or they lost the book or that kind of thing, um, that can also figure into what the environment feels like for uh, patrons who use your space. Okay, so that middle part is the sweet spot. And even though cultural competence is not something you can, you know, sort of close the book on and feel like you're done, even if it's your own culture, even if it's a culture that you know really well, but that sweet spot in the middle is where um, growth happens and when all three of those uh, realms are sort of coming together and that you're working on those, um, that's, that's a good place to be in terms of cultural competence because it's a place of growth. All right, that was a lot of stuff and uh, a good bit of sort of academic terminology. So why don't we um, take a few questions or comments, things that y'all want to, uh, to talk about from this article. And Tammy, if you would uh, field those questions for me, that would be great. Sure. I don't see any questions coming in yet. Okay, all right. Um, okay, while y'all are thinking, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And what I, the, the piece that I wanna talk about a little bit with this slide is that cognitive or interpersonal, I mean, that cognitive um, or inward gazing piece. Um, this next video that I'm playing has to do basically with what happens when you don't attend to cultural competence. Um, what kind of things come up, what kind of things come out, and then I'll do a little bit of discussion about how you deal with those things. So this is a short video, um, trigger warning. There's some uh, uh, foul language a little bit in here, but I think the metaphor that's used is, is useful enough that, um, that it helps people really understand who don't understand microaggressions. It helps you get a better grasp of what they are. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. 
whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping advice. So I love share too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, can I touch, touch your it? Hair? Yeah. Please. Oh, please. Oh, can I please? Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, annoying. Please. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. <laughs> which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. <sighs> it's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. <sighs> of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try less challenging, Major. Ow, oh, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. Um, so a few things that I want to mention about racial microaggressions, um, and I'll pause a little bit afterwards, Tammy, to, um, see if we have any questions or comments. Okay. Microaggressions often happen because of unexamined assumptions. Oftentimes people are not intentionally, um, lashing out at someone, but sometimes things we say even come as a surprise to us. I've had, you know, something will come out of your mouth and you go, wow, where did that come from? I can't believe that was still in there. Um, it's, it's in our background and we're not always aware that beliefs are still there until they come out of your mouth. And so, um, and, and some of this wisdom I have, I have come upon from doing this workshop and suggestions that people have had. Um, one student at UW, um, I did this over at the education department and she said, um, you know, I kind of liken microaggressions to when you're in a parking lot and you accidentally roll into someone's car um, and you damage their uh, fender, their you know side of their car, whatever, you didn't intend to, you didn't mean to hit them, but the damage is still done. There's still a dent in their car. Um, and so the things that, um, that I have, um, that I think are important to think about are when microaggressions happen, believe the person who has experienced the microaggression. Um, you don't get to say whether something hurt or not. It's not really your prerogative to say that. Don't minimize the impact because again, that car is still damaged, even if you didn't mean to. If you witness a microaggression and recognize that, that it is a microaggression, realize that the person who's experienced it has most likely heard the same comment over and over again throughout their lives, maybe throughout their day, um, and it's often exhausting. So that the angry black woman on the um, on the the video. Um, so think about it. Is it's, it's your turn? It's your turn to step up, step in, say something to the person who spoke the microaggression, even if it's later, even if it's not necessarily in public. You don't want to cause a big scene or confrontation, um, but point it out and don't give the other person a pass that it's okay. If you notice it and they don't, um, then it, it's your turn to be an ally. That is. Uh, really helps because of this thing in my next slide, racial battle fatigue. Um, so if it happens to be you who do it, because we, are, we all come with our own stuff. If it's you, stick your pride in your pocket and apologize, but don't expect the person um, who you've, whom you've offended to give you a pass, especially don't expect them to educate you because um, it's your job to learn about different backgrounds, different cultures, and because of racial battle fatigue. So in the early 2000s, University of uh, Utah researcher William Smith coined the term racial battle fatigue, and he used it in his paper to describe, he says he concluded that students of African descent, he was uh, particularly uh, looking at undergraduates who are African American um, at his institution, that um, those students of African descent constantly worry, have trouble concentrating, become fatigued, and develop headaches when navigating personal and professional spaces that have historically favored white people. Even more frustrating for undergraduates of color, Smith asserted, was an assumption by the majority power structure 
that leveling the playing field stopped, um, stopped at integrating them into institutions of higher education. So basically, the white people at his institution felt that, well, they're here, so what's the big deal? D you know, what more do you want? Well, quite a bit. Since then, a series of studies have built on Smith's findings with researchers coming to similar conclusions about what has been described as the pitfalls of living while black. Um, so one of my students this quarter, as we were having a similar discussion about, um, about uh, cultural competence, said that just the day before, her boss had come in, she had had a, you know, she braided up her hair and let it dry and it was, you know, sort of out and her boss came up to her and put his hands in her hair. And she had no idea what to do because that was her boss, right? Um, and so if that's the kind of thing that you, um, that you witness, it's really helpful for you to just step in and say, listen, I saw this happen and it's not okay. Um, and so I wanted to mention this because I think that this is all a part of both the inward gazing and the interpersonal. And I think that these are things that, um, that all of us should be working on constantly and helping each other work on constantly um, so that we can have better relationships um, in our libraries and in our workplaces. Okay, I'm gonna pause before we go into Crown. Do we have questions, do we have comments, um, pushback, whatever you wanna send is fine. So I actually have two that have come in. Okay. Um, one is how can we find what makes different cultures uncomfortable and inadvertently in the environmental realm? Um, I think that this is where the interpersonal comes in because if you don't know what, um, you know, for instance, I've read some articles recently on the fact that a lot of um, there are cultures in which children are, ch are taught to look adults in the eye is rude and it's disrespectful. If you don't know that that's why the child in front of you constantly looks at his or her feet rather than looking you in the eye, only somebody from that culture is gonna be able to tell you that. Yes, you may be able to read up and find that out, but um, you know, go and ask. And the only way you can ask is if people trust you, right? So I think that you're asking a really, a really big and important question that's really about the systemic nature of um, community building, if you will. And so I, I think that, that it, and sometimes it, it may take a cultural broker. For instance, somebody who's very comfortable in the library, who uses the library often, who's from a community where those people don't come into the library very often, and you need to know why. Sometimes it's the cultural brokers that can inform you and help you figure out how to make the library more welcoming. And sometimes it requires you going out, right? Okay. And then the other one was about racial battle fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, they ask, is there a resource you can recommend for us to view some demonstrations of incidents and appropriate allyship? allyship? Um, what I will do, I think we're hanging on to, uh, we're sharing this PowerPoint, is that right? With the... Yes, correct. Okay. Um, what I can do is in that previous slide, I'll embed some other research that'll help you to sort of figure out um, how these, how, how, what causes racial battle fatigue and how you can help people um, go the other direction from racial battle fatigue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Is that good? Okay. I am going to um, switch to Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut. And while I read um, this book, I hope that many of you are familiar with it already, because as you can see, you can hardly see the cover for all the awards that it won. It has done really well. I was very pleased to get to sit on a stage and have dinner also with Derek Barnes, who's gonna be in Washington State this weekend, I believe, um, the author of this book and um, wonderful person and doing some really important work. Um, he's also been writing for a long time, so I'm happy to see that he's um, getting this kind of success. Okay, so as I'm reading Crown, I want you to think about these questions. What cultural competence do you have that helps you understand this book? What cultural competence do you lack that may take part of this book outside of your comfort zone or realms of experience? And then um, I'll sort of address the question of how you can build cultural competence. So what I'd like for y'all who are, um, are online to do is think about as I read things, if there are a terminology you don't understand that comes up, type it in. If there are things that is like, oh, that, that feels familiar, that's, that's something I've done, then type that in too, okay? So we can get a little bit of feedback afterwards. All right, Jeremy, I hope I can do this correctly. I'm going to 
I think I stop sharing and then move over to my document camera. Okay, so this is Crown, Ode to the Fresh Cut. I apologize for some glare. If it's bad enough, um, Jeremy, one of you let me know, please, because my view isn't quite as good as your view, I think. So it's by Derek Barnes and illustrated by Gordon C. James. And both of these are own voices, uh, writer and illustrator. Hold on a second, let me see. I think maybe that improves the glare. Okay. Um, it does, it looks good. Okay, you should be asking when you're looking at the books that you're sharing with kids, you should know, even if um, you continue to, you know, to read uh, these other texts, you should know whether you have own voice as writers or not. Those who are from the background um, from which the book comes, okay? That's important. When it's your turn in the chair, you stand at attention and forget about who you were when you walk through that door. You came in as a lump of clay, a blank canvas, a slab of marble, but when my man is done with you, they'll post you up in a museum. That's my word. He'll drape you like royalty with that cape to keep the fine hairs off of your neck and your princely robes. It's amazing what a tight fade, high, low bald does for your confidence. Dark Caesar. Remember I said there was a terminology that I wasn't quite familiar with? All right, that was it. Okay, I think that's pretty simple. Who knows, you might just smash that geography exam tomorrow and rearrange the entire principal's honor roll. A fresh cut does something to your brain, right? It hooks up your intellectual. You're a star, a brilliant blazing star. Not the kind that you'll find on a sidewalk on ho in Hollywood. Nope, they're going to have to wear shades when they look up to catch your shine. He'll lean you back in the chair, dab that cool shaving cream on your forehead, and then craft a flawless line with that razor. Slow, steady, surgical. It frames your swagger. The cute girl in the class across the way won't be able to keep her pretty eyes off of you. Her friends will giggle and whisper, girl, he's so fine. Yeah, that's what they'll say. The whole school will be seasick from the rows and rows of ripples. You'll have more waves on your head than the Atlantic Ocean. Shout out to my do-rag and patience. There's a dude to the left of you with a faux hawk, deep part, skin fade. He looks presidential. Maybe he's a, the CEO of a tech company that manufactures cool. He's a boss, that's how important he looks. Due to the right of you looks majestic. There are thousands of black angels waiting to guide and protect him. As soon as he steps foot out that door, that's how important he looks. The dude standing in the mirror that can't, there's a dude standing in the mirror that can't get over the masterful designs crafted on the side of his dome. Everywhere he goes, people will ask for his autograph. He looks that fresh. He looks like he owns a few acres of land on Saturn. Maybe there's a river named after him on Mars. He looks that important. There are two dudes, one with locks, the other with cornrows, and a lady with a butterscotch complexion. And all they want is a shape up, tapered sides, a trim, and a crisp but subtle line. And sometimes in life, that's all you ever need, a crisp but subtle line. When your barber is done, you'll feel like a million dollars and some change. When his fingertips hit you with that apple green alcohol or that witch hazel, it'll stay, but not like a scorpion or a hornet, more like an electric stamp of approval. And when you see the cut yourself in that handheld mirror, your smile, a really big smile, that's the you that you love the most. That's the you that wins everything. That's the gold medal you. Every person in the shop will rise to their feet and give you a round of applause for being so fly. Not really, but they'll look like they want to. You'll see it in their eyes. It's the look your English teacher gives you when you, she hands you your last test with a bright red 97 slapped on it. It's how your mother looks at you before she calls you beautiful. Flowers are beautiful. Sunrises are beautiful. Being viewed in your mother's eyes as someone that matters? Now that's beautiful. You'll take it. You don't mind at all. Finally, he'll remove your cape, then swipe you down with a brush made from a golden horse tail. You'll put the money in his hand without even expecting change back. Tip that man. Tip that man. It was worth it. It always is. You know why? Because you'll leave out of the shop every single time, feeling the exact same way. Magnificent. Flawless. Like royalty. Hello, world. All right. So 
What have we got, Tammy? Let's see. Oh, I can see the chat now. <laughs> <laughs> so, go ahead. I don't have any comments on the book. If you have comments on the book, go ahead and type them into chat or if you have questions. Okay. All right. Meanwhile, I'm going to switch back. To the PowerPoint. All right. So don't forget to swap your camera back if you want that back on you. All right. Okay. So hold on. Give me a second. Video camera. All right. I'm back. Yes. Okay, now you can see me, yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, so my guess, go ahead. Oh, so um, there's one that says it's a great story, a different lens on the universal feeling of refreshment from self-care. Yes, self-care. Everybody knows what that's, what that feels good, you know. Um, good. All right, my guess is that unless you've spent a lot of time in black barbershops, this is kind of a foreign world to you. Um, and even women who take their sons or little boys, grandsons, whoever, um, are oftentimes kind of baffled by what happens in the black barbershop. And so the fact that this is such a community um, feels like, wow, I don't have that, you know, when I go to the salon is what I often hear. Um, and so that sense of community, that, that's real. Um, I was in the barbershop down in South Seattle one day and a young man had just gotten a scholarship full ride to college. So the barber who can't remember my name, but he knows I'm a professor. He said, hey, co come here and tell the professor about what, you, you know, you got that scholarship, you go into college. Oh, yeah. So like I had, you know, got all this interaction and encouraged him and all of that. And so the, the way that this community, you know, sort of um, is a part of this boy's life is, is really important in this story. Uh, but I had a, I had a, a participant who said, well, a, a white female librarian who said, I wouldn't, you know, I, I know that book, but I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole in story time. I was like, why? This is the most fabulous book. Kids need this book. She said, well, because I'm not you. I can't read it like you. Um, and so what Liz and I usually do is I read half the book and she reads the other half of the book to show that you don't have to be me to be able to share this book. But here's some of the things that I recommend that people do to work on the cultural competence piece as you share and maybe before you share the book um, or in conjunction with sharing it. So if you don't know what a crisp but subtle line is, there's all kind of images on, on Google. All right, so she's got a line and she's also got a bald fade. So it's when the hair starts out a little bit and goes to even less um, on the sides. Locks are mentioned. Um, so locks are also called dreadlocks sometimes. They're also, there's uh, other kind called sister locks that my, my daughter has. Um, but this is a twisting process. It takes years. She probably has been working on these for at least 10 years to get that long. Um, and very labor intensive, but also quite permanent. So if she doesn't want locks anymore, she's got to either cut it all off or grow it out, cut it and, you know, and, and do something else. A do-rag, uh, sometimes people wear these in public, oftentimes people go to bed with them, but it's the do-rag you wrap around to make the waves that you see on the top right. And I said, I didn't know what a dark Caesar is. Well, I do now. You see how square that cut is on the side of this man's head? That's the style of a dark Caesar. And so that was something that I had to learn from one of the participants in my workshop. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you can do to help people kind of understand, help this, the kids understand, help the parents understand, um, and to get a little, you know, sort of get everybody on the same page so that as you read this book, you know what they're talking about. Um, I'll also, I've also included some further resources um, for, <clears throat> I wrote an article uh, last year that was called Facing the Black Child for Children in Libraries that was really about this phenomenon I was seeing of over and over and over um, within the first, well, within a few months of reviewing books, I would get this full face front spanning the gutter um, child's face, or in this case, whole body, and sort of really talking about what I think that phenomenon is about at this moment in, in children's literature publishing history. Um, with, with children of color, particularly. Um, that second article is an article that a colleague and I um, 
wrote for, she's my partner in crime for all things Readorama, um, but we wrote together about African American hair and children's picture books. And then some three recent ones that I've just reviewed about um, African American hair are Don't Touch My Hair, which is about this little kid who really gets tired of everybody touching her hair. And so she just runs and everywhere she runs, like even under the ocean, the animals are still trying to touch her hair. So finally she like learns to say stop and you know, no, you can't touch my hair and set her own boundaries, um, which is as important to teach kids, you know, boundaries about their bodies. And then Hair, It's a Family Affair, I think is a really um, nice book about members of one family taking care of each other's hair. And then Princess Truly is a new, relatively new series. And this kid's hair is magical. Um, she can do things like fly when her puff balls start um, twinkling. And so it's kind of a, a new take on, on what's hair for. <laughs> Um, so here are a few ideas that I use as jumping off port for Crown, and it, you can use it with, with a lot of other books as well. Um, torn art self-portraits, I love this because it's cheap, no matter how, you know, how few resources your library has. Everybody's got construction paper, everybody's got glue, and that's all you need. You don't even allow scissors, especially um, because um, it, you tend to have like a whole lot more hangouts with perfection, with adults especially. I, I do this workshop with adults. Um, and so perfection goes out the window because you can't really tear a circle very easily. So these are some ones that children have done and can't read a Rama. Um, that's my daughter on the left there, Amelia. And then the rules are no scissors, only glue and torn paper, quick, impressionistic, let perfection go, and don't take yourself too seriously or too literally. All right, I'm running out of time. These are some ones that my adult students have done. I love Adley's um, because she wore a headscarf and felt like she didn't need to put in facial facial features because that was a really important thing that people saw um, when they see her. Um, I like the 3D hair that Courtney did as well. She had it braided and all. <clears throat> um, we also do um, poems for two voices and sometimes I'll do the torn art self-portraits in conjunction with the, the poems for two voices. And the poems for two voices are, um, these are the books that I often use to help students understand how they go and what they look like. This is an example of, um, well, you sort of attend to formatting. So you try to format the poem for two voices um, in two columns. The things that are printed right across from each other are said at the same time, even if the words are different. Tell kids especially, don't try to rhyme. Well, adults too. Don't try to rhyme. It's too hard and sometimes the poetry is just bad. And then um, connect with it with some aspect of, your, of yourself or your self-portrait, depending on if you're doing this in conjunction with um, the self-portrait or not. So here's an example of one that Liz and I wrote, and um, we recorded it, and so I'll play it for you. My dad is a professor of Japanese. Oops, hang on, let's see how I can start this over. Mine was an auto mechanics teacher. We, we both, both have, have one, one brother. brother. I hail from Columbia, Sumbi. Okay, now. I'm Liz. I'm Michelle. My traditions are Japanese and Caucasian. Mine are African American. My mom made onigiri. My mom made collard greens and black eyed peas. My dad is a professor of Japanese. Mine was an auto mechanics teacher. We, we both, both have, have one brother. brother. I hail from Columbia, South Carolina. And I from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But we both eat grits. grits love music, music, play an, an instrument, instrument, and find the best of all worlds in, in children's, children's books. books. Right. So you see, and that didn't take very much time. It's really reflective of our backgrounds. We especially both like enjoy food, so we had to integrate food into it. We both love children's books, and that's sort of what brought us together. Um, and so um, this is one that, that, that we did together. And so if you pair the poem for two voices and, um, and the self-portrait, it makes a really nice way for kids, adults, whoever you want to do it with. I've done it with the UW faculty, with uh, the iSchool faculty. That was really fun. I got to hear some stories about my colleagues that I had no idea about. So um, it can also be a really nice way to help people share some things from their background when that's sometimes not what you, what they bring to work. That's not necessarily what you see and know about them. Okay, so those are um, some things that I do in conjunction with um, Crown. Um, but obviously, if there's another book that you, you know, want to work with instead, great. Um, lots of ways to substitute. I'm just going to kind of talk through these next uh, two. Suki's Kimono, we decided to do because Crown is from my background, African American. Suki's Kimono is from um, Liz's background. She's uh, Japanese and, and white. And so we thought that this was a really um, 
pro positive it's a positive story it's also a story of a positive relationship between a grandmother and a granddaughter and a way that this child is able to suki is able to bring the kimono and the sandals that her grandmother gave her when they were at a festival um, that was celebrating japanese culture into school she wears the first day of school her older sisters are like oh man that is so not cool how can you wear that um but everybody notices her outfit and she ends up being able to talk about it and to be able to, to sort of demonstrate the dance that she and her grandmother learned together. And so um, it's, a, it's a positive story. It's a very well illustrated, what are wonderful watercolor illustrations. Um, and it also it, it explores things like um, taiko drumming. Um, so some of the questions that, sorry, my screen is not cooperating here. Um, some of the questions that we, or, there we go. Couldn't get that middle slide. Um, so these are some of the questions that we ask. Um, what do you associate with the word or image of a kimono? Um, what do you already know about Japanese cultural dress or traditional dress? And what would you need to know to be able to feel cu culturally competent when reading this book? So, you know, some of this requires some homework, some research to make sure that you um, can do it responsibly. And then what's Suki's emotional journey? How does she um, manage to really have pride in this culture that she's from? And how about um, children in your program? What kind of journeys are they going through in terms of their home culture um, and their public culture, if you will? And how can you promote cultural pride through reading of this book? And I once had a student um, who asked me why I was giving them, why my syllabus was so loaded with multicultural um, literature because she was going to be teaching all white kids. And I told her, you need these books more than anybody else then, because books can take you places where you might never go and where your kids might never go. And so even if you don't have anyone Japanese in your community, that'd be a great way to expose the kids. Um, so these were some links. And again, we'll share this PowerPoint so you can look it up. One of the most fun one is the taiko drumming, because it's not just, you know, this kind of drum. They're big, like, you know, huge mallets that they use for drumming. And it's very acrobatic in a way. Um, we have a taiko drumming women's group on at UW. And I can't wait to see them because this is not a craft that women have traditionally done. So the video that I have is, is males, three males. Um, but they're also in that video, they're their backs are facing each other. So you know they really have to be sort of in tune with each other to be able to be in sync the way they are. Uh, but these are just some other things. Um, and Matteo overall also talks about the fact that, um, that food and um, clothing and holidays are oftentimes sort of low hanging fruit. So if you're gonna do a deep dive into a culture, try to get, you, you can do those, but try to get past those because those are always the sort of most obvious things to do. And then, um, all are welcome. We chose both because it's a local uh, uh, illustrator to Seattle, and we also got to go to the launch party for this book, um, and it's 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 quite wonderful. It's also um, it doesn't this this particular book doesn't say anything about anybody's background in the story. It's about welcoming everybody into the school. At the end of the day, um, they have a celebration that um, that celebrates Chinese culture, and I think it's Chinese New Year. Um, but there are couples with two dads. There are children who are wearing a headscarf. There are children in a wheelchair. There, you know, there's so it's a, a, a montage of kids from all different kinds of backgrounds, which of course a lot of Seattle classrooms look like that. Um, and so it's it's a way to celebrate everyone without necessarily um, being very specific. Um, and so some of the things that show up visually that could be interesting ways to explore. Everybody comes to lunch and they all got a different kind of bread. And there's a little bit of a comment about that, um, but you can, you know, there are books that talk about different breads all over the world. Um, flags of the world, um, a little explanation about uh, patkas and, and turbans and the difference between those, some stuff on, on Chinese New Year, why Muslim women wear hijab, um, soccer around the world, soccer comes up in the book. And so um, these are all some ideas that can, can be extracted from a book that doesn't talk about race at all, but that present visually lots of ideas that, that could be delved into more. All right, and these are some activities that we found that would be kind of fun to do. Um, and again, there are links to these if these are things that you would like to, to do. And then, so here's, here's where I think a good place to sort of send you off. Um, but choose a book from a background that is not your own. I had a student um, who wrote up a, a 
uh, an experience that I um, facilitated. We had a readorama down at Compass on Dexter, which is about affordable housing for formerly homeless families. And she said, I was really out of my comfort zone at this, at this program. I said, great, I have done my job. So try to pick a book that's out of your comfort zone. One that, like the woman told me, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Try to, try to get to there. How would you evaluate the book, positively, negatively? If negatively, leave it alone, because if it's not a good book, it's not worth your time. What would you say about it in a review? Who would enjoy this book? Um, what child, what adult would enjoy this book? And what questions would you ask children about it? And I always encourage students to ask questions that are about what's in the book, not just, this book has a dog. Do you have a dog? Well, that's great, but it doesn't help you understand or develop a more sophisticated vocabulary about talking about what's in the book. Um, so I might talk about you know, the medium for the illustrations in Crown. I might talk about the way that um, the, the book turns in a way that's counterintuitive. When you see that whole body, you want to turn it one way, but it turns the other way. Why do you think he does that? Talking about the fact that he tells his whole story in second person. He talks about you. Why does he do that? Okay, so those are the things that take you into the book to really um, help kids explore more and develop a more sophisticated vocabulary about talking about books. And then if a certain level of cultural competence is needed for understanding and enjoying the book, how can you get there? What can help you to prepare? And that might be different for every book, um, but there's plenty that you can do rather than reading a book cold, which you should never do, obviously. Um, but even if you just read it so that you can read it well, that's good, but if it's got cultural content, you really need to do some homework as well. And here's some that we um, have enjoyed exploring in workshops, and um, these are all from different backgrounds. Um, Liz and I are working on some research right now uh, that includes Where's Rodney? That's about the dearth or the lack of African-American kids um, having immersive outdoor experiences in picture books. There are very few of them. I was a, I'm a lifetime Girl Scout. I did a survival thing as a like ninth grader and survived off, off of the land in Michigan and all that. There are no books. There are severe, we found four books so far where kids are just um, so immersed in the outdoors that they sort of, you know, the, the rest of things just kind of go away. There are not many of those. Um, so figuring out where the gaps are as well and trying to make sure you bring those books in that represent those rather unusual experiences. All right, and then just an encouragement to, um, you know, to not to wait for a celebrations like DIA, um, but to, you know, make use of, of, of those celebrations. And I also say, you know, Black History Month is great, but it should be Black History Month all year long. It should be Women's, you know, History Month all year long. It should be Poetry Month all year long. And so really um, try not to wait for those holidays, but integrate diverse books every day. All right, there is a, probably no time for questions. It's 10. <laughs> It is 10, but we are recording this, so if people need to go ahead and open their libraries for the day, um, you can return back to the Washington State Library trainings page, and we will have the recording there later this afternoon. Um, there was one question that popped up after the reading of the book, or one comment, is, I absolutely love this book. I feel uncomfortable as a white, middle-aged woman sharing it because it's not my culture. I worry about the accent I might use. I worry about minimizing. And I want so badly to share this book, but I have such fear. OK. Um, I'd like for you to push past the fear. I had an exchange with a student just last night as I was grading papers. And the student was reading a book called Benny Doesn't Like to Be Hugged by Zeta Elliott. It's a book about a child with autism who is brown, who is African-American. And the student was reading the book, a white female middle class student was reading the book to the three kids at Compass who are formerly homeless, so low income. All three are black boys. And what she said to me was, I felt really uncomfortable asking them the questions that I had prepared, one of which was, when was the last time you read a book with a kid in it who looked like you? And what I said to her, she said, oh, the kids just, she said, I felt uncomfortable saying it, but the kids rolled with it. They were like, oh yeah, well, I read this one in school and I think I, I've saw, seen this one and that other group has a book about a you know, brown kid or whatever. So it's rolled with it. And what I said to her is that these African-American boys growing up in Seattle where um, three, 4% of the population is African-American, the likelihood that they're gonna have maybe ever in K-12 a teacher and maybe even a librarian who looks like them, 
to be able to share these books is minimal. The likelihood that a white librarian or teacher is going to share these books with them is high. And so if we wait for the demographics to shift over so that only brown librarians are reading to them these books that they need, they're never going to get them. They'll be adults. And so I would like for you to think about pushing past your discomfort because it's not about you. It's about those kids who need these books. And the reason why Liz and I share the reading is for that very reason, because she doesn't read it like me. She reads it straight. I got all kind of attitude in here because that's who I am. You bring who you are to your books and that's good. But don't let that stop you. Don't let the fact that you can't read this book like me stop you. It's not appropriation if you're reading it like you read it. Ask questions that the kids can answer. Um, help them to appreciate this hair even if they don't have it. You can have an audience of all white kids and that is fine. Read the book because they need to see that there's a community in this barbershop, even if they'll never walk into a, a black barbership, barbershop. Um, that enriches their life and it'll enrich yours too. So I would love for you to use the book um, and let me know how it goes. Okay, so there's kind of the other side of that was a comment that says, I'm sorry, I'm really uncomfortable with this book. It seems like it places the same absolute value on personal appearance, appearance that women have to battle with. Our value does not lie in our appearance. Right. And you know what? I think this bush, book pat, pushes past that, right? Because it's not just about him looking good. It's about him, um, about the looking good being a springboard to him feeling good. I don't know any other book, any book. And I know, I mean, you see my shelves here? I know a lot of books. I don't know any other book that connects scholastic aptitude with a child's self-care, with a Black child's self-care, right? Um, and because, you know, he talks about you know, the, the bright red A on his, um, on his, it'll help him to, uh, to do well on his test. Um, yeah, there's stuff about, you know, the girls liking him and whatnot, but it's about his mother's love for him. Um, you know, I, it, it, I understand that, that that is a possible reading um, of the book, but I think that this one for me is an outlier because of the community that's focused on. I think it really sort of depends on your focus. And I think it also, my lens is different because I see how, um, how much community is built in these spaces. And I'm doing some other research right now that's, that's called uh, an article um, by a sociologist called, that's called The White Space. And he talks about the way that there are spaces that are sort of coded as white and a lot of offices are like that. You know, there was redlining in Seattle where black people could only live in certain places in town. And so his point is that there have traditionally been these spaces that are white spaces and for black people to come into them, they have to prove daily that they belong there. They have to oftentimes um, change their behavior so that they are speaking in standard English and no one expects them, you know, is looking at them like they are from the ghetto or whatever. He maps the, the ghetto as the quintessential black space, the place where uh, white people think black people belong. And so, but in order for, um, for, for white people to go into black space, that's very intimidating. Maybe that's partly what this book is about because feeling like you're sort of entering, entering black space, feeling not safe or I don't know enough or things like that. Um, but, you know, I think um, the, the, the issue really is that it, 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 that for the librarians, it's, it's not about you. And I think that there are so few books where um, positive portrayals of African American boys um, are put forward that I think it's worth the risk of some of the other things that maybe you're not as, as comfortable with. Um, and so, and, and if this book doesn't do it for you, that's fine, find another one. Because um, even though we still are to the point where uh, any experience that you have as a child, that you can find a book that has a, a, a child of color doing that thing, we're not there yet. We still have a long way to go before um, the, the record sort of represents all different kinds of experiences for um, children of color and indigenous children, but um, but but it's getting better. It's getting better. So find a book that works for you. If this one doesn't, that is okay. 
Okay. So I'm getting a lot of people who are leaving, including a couple who are taking off for story time. All right. So hopefully they will have some, some new skills in their back pocket to be able to use. Um, the, one of the last comments was, the experience of married cultures is that the appearance is very important. And part of cultural competence, I think, is acknowledging, accepting, and celebrating that. Exactly. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Martin. This has been just a really informative. Someone posted that they wish it could be twice as long, and I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The activities really enrich as well, but yeah. Yes, absolutely. They can invite me. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a part come. two. <laughs> yes, I will come. Okay. <laughs> I also want to thank everybody who attended today, um, and especially to you, uh, Dr. Martin, if you've enjoyed this session. Um, the webinar will be available later today, and it sounds like we're going to also be able to post the slides separately, and you had mentioned you might add a couple more links for people to be able to follow. Is I that will. correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so go ahead and tell your coworkers you can come back to these webinars at any time. You can revisit them. They'll they'll be up for forever as far as as long as we have a web page. <laughs> um, and please also remember to take the survey at the end or follow the link available on the first Tuesday's archive page. So next month, um, our Tuesday first Tuesday's webinar will be on June fourth at again at nine o'clock. We'll have three presenters who will be discussing GIS, which is how open data, maps, and actually kindergartners all kind of fit together in helping um, organizations unlock geography from the data they use every day to make decisions about services within their communities. So again, that'll be June 4th at um, nine o'clock and on behalf of all of us here at the Washington State Library and our presenter thank you and have a great rest of your day thank you